question about agencies or ministries in the government. Why not one specifically for human rights? We know anti-corruption commission, we know our general ministry. Why not human rights? And so they, they were saw that there was a need for a human rights commission. Human rights principles are evolving and its scope is being larger at the international level. Human rights activities, human rights issues are coming day by day. Remember from the beginning we had the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. That was the human rights instrument. After that, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights had the model split and brought in the, the what? So the human rights were around the table. They brought in the ICCP era and they brought in the economic, cultural, social rights. Plus the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, they were called the body of, law, of, of human rights law at the time. Out of those three now, of course, we have a total of nine treaties right now. Nine. So from one to two to three, and now we have nine. And still there are a lot of other optional protocols that are coming up. So it is evolving every day. So there's a need for someone on the ground to control it. This is the national human rights institution. What I, what I would want, and I will say again for the sake of just, this is just a, 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 a break for, this, for the discussion. So you can stop me any point, you can inject any point, you can question any point, because these are all professionals around the table. We have the commissioners, that's why we insist that the commissioners, you know, made themselves possible so that you can engage them. So as I go along, wherever the commissioners who are experts around the table, wherever the experts around the table want to live, brief, Interjection, I will start, you can go through it. So there's not a teaching class, there is just to set the basis for the discussion. Traditional institutions having power to protect human rights have limited power and mostly cannot play an advisory role to government and other promotional role. Again, we need a national human rights institution because traditional institutions or traditional groups merely play the role of protection in communities. In our in our legal areas, you know, you know how to reach community. It is the traditional leaders that play the role of promotion and protection, right? But unfortunately, the advisory role they should play to government, we see it from a human rights perspective, are not being balanced. And I will not tell you why, because you are in the field, you know. That is why we need a national human rights institution that will balance that advice that will be coming to, to government, and I will also balance the kind of response that will be going to our 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 traditional community and institution. For example, let's come into our, our, our central area. We talk about gender ministry. It's a traditional institution that really focuses only on our women and our children. Right? To so all the human rights areas, they are not concerned about it. Health ministry. Health is also a human rights issue, but they are considering only health issues. But the national human rights institution will take all those different institutions and synchronize their different work into one purpose. The purpose is promotion and protection of human rights. Some of you don't know that water and seawall is also an issue of human rights, right? EPA, but they all have their specific responsibility. But now this national human rights institution, they all fall into it. A large number of international instruments must be promoted at the national level, which traditional institutions cannot do. I gave you one. CEDAW. CEDAW, many people believe it's specifically for what? General Ministry, right? When they say CEDAW, General Ministry get around the table to draft the CEDAW report. But little do you know that CEDAW has impact on every agency of government. But traditionally, these international instruments we tend to tie it to specific institutions. Now it is the Human Rights uh, Commission or National Human Rights Institution responsibility to take the message out of the general ministry and disseminate it among civil society and the rest of the other interest groups that are responsible for such. Human rights protection is the responsibility of state and there is a need for an independent institution to oversee whether government is fulfilling its obligation. I said it from the beginning that it is the state's responsibility to protect, promote, and fulfill human rights. But we need within the state what we call a, a, a red light. Stop for inspection. Go, you are free to go. Slow down, 
That's what we're letting to the vehicle, right? So as government is running, we need a national institution that will keep whispering the government, you're running too fast. Slow down. You're going on the wrong lane. Come back. Because it is the government responsibility. It is not civil society. It is not even a national community responsibility. And so we need a national institution that will help government succeed. Of course, there is a need for a body which is flexible in procedure, accessible to people. Of course, the National Human Rights Institution, one of the reasons for them is for them to be accessible. People can easily walk into the Human Rights Commission premises to complain they are walking to Temple of Justice or the police station. Two of us. You can easily walk into the Human Rights Commission compound and say, I came to complain they are walking to the police station or walking to the courts. The bureaucracy, there should not be a bureaucracy at National Human Rights Institution. Independent institution, we can work with civil society in the national bodies and government. The independent human rights commission should be a more than a twin model because twin models are two, right? They are more than a twin model because they are there to feed with both international organizations, government, and civil society. That's why we need the, the, the national institutions. Historically, where this idea of a national institution came from? This is that the story of those. 1978, the United Nations organized a seminar in Geneva on national and local human rights. So it started from 1978, this, the discussion started. This discussion came down to 1991 when it was properly organized during the Paris summit. But we now call the Paris principle coming up. This discussion came up to 1993 when a resolution was put together. Finally, this resolution now is called the Paris Principle. From the beginning, I said we had a commission before, but that commission was not in line with the Paris Principle. And so, during the 2003 conversation, that commission was disbanded in order to bring in a commission that will have the full structure of the Paris Principle. Then in 1993, the Vienna Declaration adopted the human rights to reaffirm the new rule. So you see, in 1993, when the resolution came up, again in Vienna, it was confirmed that this is the way national institutions should operate. Then in 1994, the International Coordinating Committee of National Institutions established as a representative body. Now this ICC began now to register National Human Rights Institution. So we see the, the involvement from 1978, it started coming until at the point of 1994, we now have the ICC to begin to register national human rights institutions. The ICC, which is coordinated by it, they work with the Commission on Human Rights. Of course, the, the organization has organized this from the Liberia office. In 2000, the ICC started the registration of membership procedure. In 2000, it started the registration. Remember, ICC started in 1994, and then 2000, they started registration. They gave status, A status. Right now, they have more than 84 members. They had 84 at the time. Right now, they have more than 84. And they gave status by A, B, C. And they have one other status, A, R, that is for full member board. Reserve. Liberia, fortunately, you were, some of you should know as an A status. That means they have met the criteria of the Paris principle. But A status, it must meet the standard of the Paris principle. What is this Paris principle we're talking about? It is the international non binding standard. They set standards for national human rights institutions as we guide their competence, responsibility, composition, and guarantee of independence and pluralism and method of operation. It depends on your act. Some act do not have you to handle issues on individual basis. They handle issues on group basis. So it, 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 it depends on how you craft your act. 
seek an amicable settlement. Sometimes national institutions are mandated to, to settle disputes. While others, they don't have the right to settle disputes, they can only receive complaint and file it to court. They don't have the right to settle disputes. Informing the party on the available remedies and promoting access to them. You see, national institutions do not only tell you that you have the right to go to court, they should help you go to court. Because there are some people, they don't know the procedure. So you just tell them the best thing you can do, go find a lawyer and go to court. Perhaps the person does not have money to get a lawyer. It is under the, the jurisdiction of a national human rights commission to assist the person getting the remedy that is needed. Hiring complaints or transmitting them to other institutions. Hearing complaints or transmitting them to other institutions. You will get to know in the discussion along the way whether our formation meets the status. But we are saying these are the status of a national human rights institution. So during the discussion, we we'll hear from them what are the lack of those standards, why they lack it, whether they have all the standards that we're talking about, what are they doing with it, and is it available to us to be part of our discussion. Making recommendations to competent authorities. Are they making recommendations? How well are these recommendations publicized? Those are some of the questions we'll be discussing in the of court. According to the Paris principle, they should make recommendations to other authorities. Competent authorities. Various types of national human rights institutions. These are various types of national human rights institutions. I don't know where our own fit around here. They have advisory institutions. They have an East French, the advisory institutions such as the National Consultative Commission on Human Rights of France. That is an advisory institution. They don't have the full makeup as our commission has yet. We have the institute such as the Dennis Center for Human Rights we do in independent research on human rights. They have specialized institutions such as the Ombudsman, Commission for Children, Women, Racial Discrimination. You can establish it in your country. It's not a full-fledged human rights commission, but you can have specific automatic area that you can form uh, an independent group on. And then, of course, we have human rights commission. These are national human rights institutions in state sets which try Straight sense we try to comply most of the principles set for the Paris Council. If you want to have a human rights commission, it means a human rights commission should go strictly by the Paris principle. It's your choice as a nation. You, you are not forced to have a national human rights institution. You can have an ombudsman, you can have an advisory institution. But if you choose to have a national human rights institution, it should reflect fully the Paris principle. Of course, we know how the national human rights institution here. When it comes to the Paris principle, there are key words that we need to consider independence, competence, guarantee. Those are key words. So then, to be an independent, you have on your own. A guarantee of being able to become, to deliver. In case someone of hope that you are strong. The competence of you being able to deliver adequately in case someone of hope that you can do something. Now, the government of Nigeria, the Paris Council say that the government should establish you. It becomes somehow cooling. When you are established by the government, the government forms you 100 percent down five, down two, down three. Though you seem to be independent, but you are independent. That has to be added. Though you seem to be independent, but you are independent. Simple example. When our government got into office, there is a manipulation, political manipulation to play with it, with the independent council with the RSACR, in order to be entertained, in order to take it out. Now, what is the independence of this particular commission when the government has a say? The government does whatever it wishes to do at whatever time. Then what becomes it? It makes the institution become somehow quasi, you know, once a quasi, somehow weak and cannot bring all the actuality of it. Okay. So, because of this, I'm seeing, I'm seeing that the independent commission is not doing what it should do because of fear. So, 
it's not actually the thing, an independent act, it should be because of what they do. They do. That one don't care. Okay, that's your, that's your opinion. And you know, we got a two days today, so. Uh, in terms of responsibilities, I think we should be in practice of something. When we talk about uh, funding support, you have to take into consideration that the financial stream of government is centralized. We talked about three branches of government the judiciary, as well as the legislature, that the GSK is like a to be able to get money. So, when we're talking about in, in terms of the ability to deliver. I think one of the discussions that we need to ensure that gets on the platform is how the independent human rights commission can be supported by other arms, civil society, international organizations, to ensure the independence of getting as many uh, 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 support to be able to perform the act. Additionally, and I think um, it's necessary that we hear this in this group, but there was a disconnect of information or the tenure. I recall when we had a NARAC meeting at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I raised an issue that there were five institutions that came out of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, and the Independent Human Rights Commission is one of them. So you cannot temper with the tenure of the Independent Human Rights Commission, and I think there may be a discussion that we can continue to proper as civil society actor. Because it was a CPA that got us here with 16 years of peace, and we need to ensure that that aspect continues to be. Because if you violate anything that has to do with people independent and making sure that they can perform the Paris principle as prescribed by what every independent human rights commission is supposed to be able to achieve, you tend to get to a stage where you have a, a, a rubber stamp institution. And I don't think that was the purpose for which the Human Rights Commission was captured in the CPA. Child of government, a newborn, the parent, the child must, you know, make sure they show that the upkeep of that child to make sure the child is vibrant, you know, come out with play a responsible role. So I think that's a very good uh, example. But again, looking at the, the this commission and government, um, we have to address the issue of uh, perception. And you know, what kind of perception government which is a parent have towards his child? You know, because if you know that your child is a child that's gonna do you well, you will get all the support. Okay? So but sometimes if the child is is is, is 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 perceived to be a problem child, <laughs> then when you support that child with that kind of perception, the child is not a problem child, but the perception, the perception created about this child. So we don't need to beat around the bush. In our own Liberal context, we think uh, the, the, the commission is not getting the expected level of support that it needs to get from the government. I think that's, that's where we are. What is responsible for that? I think we need to be looking at the issue of perception problem. How do we this uh, perception problem between the government and, uh, and, and uh, us? And the other issue also is that even the, 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 the creation of the commission. Because Liberia is part of uh, international protocols and convention, and some of those protocols and conventions for you to be seen good in the eyes of the international community, there are certain things you must do. One of which is the creation of this uh, commission. I don't know of any moment that you don't have this commission, how you will function in the eyes of the international community. So to just to do that as a justification to get other benefits, to create a commission. But creating a commission is one thing. Getting the commission to have the expected level of support is another. The other, the other last part I want to comment on is, even which I think uh, is really a way forward, which is this collaboration. What kind of relationship should be there between the, the, the civil society and this commission? Because between the two bodies, we also have to uh, really frankly and honestly look at the issue of a perception. What kind of perception we have about uh, one another, the, the independent commission, and then the civil society. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are even that we really need to look at. Thank you, Remy. I think you set the basis, and I said I'll close with you. You set the basis for the two days discussion. Perception. The question is, why is that perception legal? Why? 
we should be there to answer the why. Is the commission doing something and causing the perception? Can the commission do something to erase that perception around the table? You should ask the hard question. The next thing I want to say and close on this issue, we call the commission with legislators around the table, and they are here, the commissioners are here. And do you know the question the legislator asks us in the face of the commissioner? He said, but is the commissioner functional? He said, but we only see these people stand for budget. We don't know that they are functional. So thank you for bringing them around the table, but we, we didn't know who was going to work with the people said. Some of the commissioners were angry, and they responded appropriately. Because maybe they have been working with individual lawmakers, and some of the other lawmakers who are maybe, I will, I will hear they say they are too busy, they, 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 they're not even paying attention to what is happening out here. But how can we make them pay? Is the commission engaging more as possible for the Paris, for Paris principle? Let's not look at it and see what's not a group or a commission on one side. Yes, there's a perception. But is the commission engaging more? Can we have them engage more? Is the commission engagement open enough? Or is it closed? How can we open the engagement? When we leave from here today, as part of the roadmap, we expect that civil society put around this room in meeting up with or reporting obligation. Uh, there is where you know we're supposed to be providing technical expertise to support government in meeting up with this uh, reporting obligation. Then, to cooperate with the United Nations and any agency in the United Nations or related to the United Nations system, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, other regional institutions and the national institutions of all, and the national institutions of other countries which are competent in the areas of the protection and promotion of human rights. This one just generally speaks to the fact that we have to network across our borders. Eleven, to assess the formulation of programs for the teaching of and research into human rights and to take part in their execution in school in schools, university, and professional circles. Of course, we're supposed to uh, make sure that we are able to spread human rights so the schools, universities, in high school, primary school, professional circles, like the government, institutions, we all do human rights basically, so basically if you're a civil servant, you're supposed to understand what human rights is and how human rights relate specifically to the kind of work that you do. So how do we provide those pro education to professional institutions that, like the military, the, the immigration that has to do with the you know, people who are coming to our borders, they have to interact with you know, uh, foreigners, and, Maybe refugees, how do they apply the standards? We have to be able to reach out to those people, the police that interact with our citizens every day. We have to be able to work on those. Twelve, to publicize human rights and efforts to combat all forms of discrimination, in particular ethnic discrimination by increasing public awareness, especially through the dissemination of, dissemination of information and education and by making use of state and public media organs. So uh, our, our, our latest effort in this direction is our Human Rights and Justice Program that is aired every Friday, uh, 1 o'clock, at one o'clock on the EFBC. So uh, we have to get across to the general public on human rights issues. 13, we said to act as a source of human rights information for the government and people of the Republic of Liberia. This specifically means that we have to 
of all of the necessary human rights statistics will be the statistics house for human rights in the Republic of Liberia. So if the government wants statistics for any human rights issue, they must be able to refer to the, the IMCHR. Similarly, if, if uh, civil society wants any human rights issue, uh, information on any human rights issue, they must be able to come to the IMCHR. Would it? To assist in educating public opinion and promoting awareness and respect for human rights and international humanitarian laws, treaties, and protocols to which the Republic of Liberia is a party. Fifteen says to act upon any legislative and administrative provision as well as provisions relating to judicial organization intended to preserve and extend the protection and promotion of human rights. 16, to prepare quarterly and annual reports on the national human rights situation generally and on more specific matters such as armed aggression against the Republic of Liberia, internal conflict, crimes against humanity, war crimes, torture, and genocide. So here we should be able to produce a human rights situation report, and we can report on other specific uh, human rights team. Uh, we just listed you know, some of them, and at the time, we had just come from war, so you see most of them, you know, talking about genocide, you talk about you know, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Those were the, those were the generative team during the period when the act was being developed. But it does not restrict us, we can you know, do more, you know, look at more specific uh, things. 17 says, uh, prepare and submit written annual reports to the heads of the three branches of government. So, while we prepare our human rights situation report, the report is for the entire Republic of Liberia, but like every government institution, we're supposed to also prepare our annual report. And our annual report, the same, should be shared with the three branches of government specifically. The three branches of government you know, are mentioned here simply because they don't want they don't want the illusion that because our commissioners are appointed by the executive, the president, therefore our commission, our commission is under the executive. No, it's not. It's an independent commission, it's a state owned commission. So uh, with respect to this uh, provision, the functions that we see here, we try to you know, structure the IMCHR accordingly. So the IMCHR, to a certain extent, is still emerging. It's still emerging. You may not be able to see very clearly. It's very clear that we will imagine it. You may not be able to see very clearly, but the ICHR as a creature is still growing. So, like any organism, it is bound to change shape. And especially when they have seen that the institution is perpetual, that means that it's not a human being that will die at a certain time, it, it has to continue to grow. So when it gets old, it has to you know, find a way to grow again, you know, change shape. So such an organization has to go on several reviews, or else it will be like most of the political parties in Liberia, you know, that just die out. An institution that fails to review itself and allow critical uh, comment, critical assessment of itself, can move anyway. Such is the Independent National Commission on Human Rights. So, at the Independent National Commission on Human Rights, 
the apex body is the chair and the board of commissioners. We have the board of commissioners. The board of commissioners are we have people who are co-equal. So among them, we have the first of the equals. So it's the chairperson, and then they elect from among them a vice chairperson also. So the board of commissioners provide the policy direction of the commission. They dictate how the commission functions and how the commission works. Of course, in compliance with the act. But of course, you know the board of commissioners will only have seven member board of commissioners. So they can do the day-to-day -day work of the commission in terms of implementation fully. So they have to have a secretary that support their work. But importantly, the board of commissioners also keep watch over the secretariat in such a way that the commissioners have thematic oversight as well as, well as department oversight. So according to the functions of the commission, we have five departments anyway, but because the commission core business is human rights, I will just be dealing with the, you know, other three departments that deal with human rights issue. So, like I said, broadly, the mandate is to promote and protect human rights. Therefore, we, our structure divides the protection function from the promotion function of the commission. So, two of the departments are responsible for human rights promotion why one is responsible for the protection of human rights. So I'll just go strictly with respect to how they are structured here. And mind you, I said that we are evolving, and therefore this structure that you see here is not fixed in stone. We're still trying to build the institution. So we have the Department on Education, Information, and Training. <coughs> there we have two a division or unit, we can say. We have the Division on Education and Training, and then we have the one on Information, Communication, and Technology. Uh, basically, we say that The functions that are read to you, those re related to providing education and then providing information to the government public, this department is responsible for that. So we supposed to be providing education. But if you look at the, the Human Rights Commission and you look at all... I remember that there was no many kind of relationship that we had today compared at that time. As a matter of fact, it was based on the strengthening of our, our relationship that led to the great day that we attained today. So, but uh, I think we could go further more to that. Uh, there are some issues within the Human Rights Commission that need to be addressed also. Uh, and it cannot be addressed alone without the support of civil society. As a matter of fact, uh, I also have to understand the fact that uh, they are the offspring of the civil society. And most of them also are part of civil society they want to go to that place. So uh, it's very important that we study that relationship. Okay, uh, till now, the independent human commission is not complete. 
We have we have appointed Lady Chairman in Mount. July and August 2016, I can't remember exactly. The chief was sent for for us to look for the chairman for the in the Human Rights Commission. And we quickly do our job as usual. But in now, it did not really happen. And uh, situation continued like that. But one of the things that she just raised that day, which of course, we are the civil society will be looking at, is the issue of the chairman. In the act, it requires to be a senior counselor. So under our law, who is a senior counselor? To just support his support. So this has been really handled uh, in the, the area of the now. So I think we have to, I don't know who will do that, but I think it will be the independent one of the commission, then for so we have to look at that act that it's not necessary to be cancelled out. It's not necessary. As a matter of fact, uh, not every commissioners on the human rights commission to be lawyers. And that's why we were doing the fact at that time we do it with open-mindedness to see the reason that each commissioner that we look at, there are some, some certain area that they influence things to happen on the commission. That's what we did. I remember one of the lawyers during the interview, who is also here, was a practicing lawyer at that time. I said, well, um, you are a lawyer, but do you have any experience when it comes to human rights issues? What are legal practitioners? The human rights practice a little bit different from legal practice. That's a flexibility when it comes to human rights lawyer and the court rule lawyer. It's not the same. So the president of the have experience and today is the we got somebody again that okay uh, over the time the human rights commission has been, you know, I've not been able to go as a prostitute because of one thing, because of other issues. Then we we'll ask society and look at some people that we know can be able to from the town, apart from the government support, because also one of the ignorance that we're being facing. So I'm not bringing to us to understand that. One, that area of the, that we have to the act, that we see the area of the chairman sitting there, not so good as the council of the law. Because Chief Justice himself, what is that point? It's not necessary to be councillor at law, a senior councillor at law, it's not necessary. It was not necessary to be a lawyer. Thank you. You must have experience in human rights. You must have a uh, human rights administration. Perfect. So that's what we are talking about. But all in all, uh, human rights commissions, we need to work together. But we say over and over and over. I think we'll move away again and go back again to the same thing. Most of the time, you want us to work to you. We can work to you, no problem. But most of the time, bring our attention to this. Let's work together. I remember when they come to the issue of the tenor. Well, I saw the tenor, I saw the the printing for that commission that it need to be the same I was saying that we know the step. So I called the chairman of the human rights commission as the acting chairman for I mean uh uh B uh BCC eh? Yeah, BBC. Okay, I'm calling you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, really thank you for the explaining of your presentation. And um, actually, if we have started the uh, collaboration from the beginning, from the past up to the present, I think civil society and I initially are to have a good full project. All of what we have been discussing is strengthening capacity to be as it is. Because civil society will make issues with open policy maker. But when you get a blessing, then you go up there. Then you tell your back and then we'll make it forget about them. And yet again, we have come back. This interaction is very good. It shouldn't be one day or two days. But we need to continue to be comparing those. We go places where your monitor don't go. And I agree with you, I was somewhere in I met a guy, he said, from ISCR. He was taking Roma. 
and local constraint. Actually, it is true. ISAR function is very big, but if you can collaborate constructively, constructively with civil society, I think it will be full progress. And depending on government and government, that does not, you don't need to carry them. It will be women's civil society and will look at the evil act because the independence that you get out of you as a people. If you cannot be independent, all right? As you can see, that like, right now, like, where it's bleeding, we all need to fight out together to see our best and continue some of these situations that is ongoing. So there is a need of strengthening and building the capacity and building a fast bridge between civil society and our island society. Okay. Uh, first, uh, let me say thank you. But I got an invitation to come and speak to the of these people. Plenty of things came to my mind. One, that do I start? What do I, what do I offer these uh, intellectuals I'm going to be who have been in this field for a long time? I've been away for eight years now, so some of the things I do, I'm really forgetting some of them. So it, it took me a very long time to come to myself and compose my paper. I sat there a little bit, and I don't want to hold you down to all oh, what I put down. I don't want to hold you down as to what human rights is, what are the instruments you use, the origin of it, and whatsoever you I think that these are things that you are professionals and you know. So let me go straight into my people to go to the topic of which I was assigned. The role of civil society is the promotion and protection of human rights. Government is a stakeholder. You need to work with government. 
not compromising what you believe in and what you want to do. You don't have to fight with government, neither you don't have to compromise with whatsoever government does. Your word is independent because your word is to ensure that the fundamental rights of every citizen is protected. CSO actors must be guided by their independent, they must guide their independent jealousy. Independence is your independence. Under no circumstances must you compromise your independence. You will be stabbed with essential. People will stop you from accessing forms and resources to do your work. But that should not make you to yield to the temptation to double your independence. Now when the government will stop on you. So now stakeholder, do not, do not organization provide funding. We now want to give you your money on you do certain things. But in the what you do, you want to must preserve your independent jealousy. Your independence is your integrity that you have to live with. I remember when I was head of JPC, uh, one organization came to me, he wanted to do HIV, AIDS, and wedding. I told him, I said, for what you have to say, it's not what JPC does. You do not have the expertise. Oh, the money is available, we can give the money, you can recruit people, blah, 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 blah. I said, no. We are not involved in HIV prevention, education, whatsoever. Go and look for an organization that specializes in this kind of work. The kind of work we do as civil society, we want to have a defined work that we're supposed to do. Do not go wrong with it because the money is there. And you don't have the expertise. You will not deliver what you're supposed to deliver. If you do that, you will bring your credibility and you will compromise your independence. Then your second to humanity is driven by what the donor gives you. That is not the passion for which you are established. Every civil society organization should be established to have a principle for which they are, they are established. If your work is to engage in advocacy for human rights, fine. If your work is to provide, the, to monitor the person and see to it that they abide by international standards, the national standards are provided for by our law, it's good. That's my friend, uh, uh, If your work is to provide uh, legal aid for indigent people, do it and do it to the best of your ability. If the work is to monitor and report human rights abuses wheresoever they become, do it and do it available. There will be a mission statement for which every civil society organization is established. Do not say, okay, I will establish it and uh, I'll be hosting around. No. There will be a mission for which you are established as a civil society organization. If your work is to provide uh, health services for people, fine. Get your expertise in that. If your work is to engage in booming issues, advocate in booming issues, or general issues, but you must have the defined objective for which you are established. And that mission statement will determine your work and how you go about your work. I am not speaking of only government, but all stakeholders who may seek to exploit your, in, your dependence on funding to impose their agenda on you and compromise your independence. So meaning, even if the man came up a billion dollars, and said, no, I have a billion dollars to give to you, but you have to do X, Y, Z. And if that is not in your mission, and you went for it, then they will detect to do what you do. Sometimes they will take the content of your report you're supposed to be. Then your independence will be good. Of course, I understand that the kind of work we do in civil society will be funded. 
but the nature of your wife will attract money to you. So now you gotta look for it. When I launched the legislative report card in this country, I didn't get no project for that money. You should call me one day and say, no, no, what you are doing, can you do this type of thing? And they gave me the money. Of course, I'm not going to disclose that more money, they gave me the mission. <laughs> but they saw what we were doing, and they believed in what we were doing. So I said, no, they are giving you this, they are trying to see what they are doing this type of thing, and they did it successfully. So, my friends, this work here is the work of passion. You must understand the passion. You must have the passion. And you must understand the issues you want to deal with. There's no way you can advocate for an issue that you don't understand. No. You will know what human rights violations are as opposed to what human <coughs> violation is. People will run to you. Say, oh, for example, uh, Nigerian people say, oh, the people came to arrest me after 12 minutes, after 6 o'clock. Who told you people can arrest you after 6? But many people have that belief. Even those of all in civil society believe that policemen are going to arrest you after 6. You will understand that if the issue is a criminal issue, police can arrest you any day, any time, any hour. But if you don't know here, I can advise somebody. If the issue is a separate issue, now, then the sexual party can be released. Because in a civil matter, the court cannot issue a rate of arrest. The court can issue a rate of summons. So the tell you, say, Council of Two, you are someone who can file your return on, on this day at this hour. It's clear. So, to cancel service, I mean, someone may you can't have no more to buy the thing and get it. Because really, someone is not to arrest you. Get on, give it to you, you sign for it, and you go. So you will understand the issue that you want to deal with. You got to do a little bit extra reading to understand the whole concept of human rights. It's a whole field of study. You've got to understand it. You've got to understand the issues. You've got to articulate the issue, articulate it well. In that form, and you've got to be brave. There's no way you can protect somebody's right or teach somebody to protect their right when you yourself don't understand why protecting your rights are. No. Or there's no way you can tell the message, oh, my police can't do it after six o'clock, don't go anywhere when you know it, why you say it's not correct. So you will understand the issues that you want to deal with. Accountability. Say what society will be accountable. There's a serious problem in all the civil society. We want other people to be accountable, but we do not want to be accountable. Even civil society organizations will pay their taxes to government. It's a problem. I remember when in civil society, where I want to be in government, they want to pay taxes. So my colleagues say, oh, why did you go and plant down on us? I said, no. It's not coming down on us. The law provides that once you have an income, you will pay taxes to government. So you will be accountable in what you do. You will be accountable to your employees. So who are in leadership to get a grant from donor will not even pay full disclosure. Will not. You got to be accountable to yourself, to your people, to your donor, to your employees, and to the society that you are serving. You say at this moment, the sins to be, the sins to be, the sins to be. That uh, some society organizations, especially human rights uh, groups, are not talking much. And they are giving, maybe they are not talking a lot. And you are quite right. But 
my question is, how can a human right defenders in this country be protected? Because as we speak now, there is a huge fear, you know, in the in the minds of human rights defenders, especially those of us that have been preparing for God on government and the also society. So is there a way that we can use all uh, yes, you know, how can you know right defenders be protected, you know? Uh okay. three or four questions, we'll move on to uh uh Commissioner Bray Johnson. Uh, our facilitator will shut down after a few questions. Councilor, yes, thank you. I mean, no surprise for this uh, very brilliant, insightful uh, lecture. I mean, I'm not a lawyer and don't know me, but and I really am very ignorant of a lot of the stuff in terms of how the court system works, but the justice system works, my dear. But I was in Bikina over the last week. And uh, I visited the prison. Uh, we've been, the commission been visiting six counties. And I mean, as usual, I know how the prison condition is. But we keep hearing, I mean, some of the appalling conditions in the prison. Sometimes <laughs> there was a guy who had been in prison for eight months. And he was in prison because of. Uh, Bed of uh, coconut. And we asked him, he said, How much for the bed of coconut? He said, 700 hours. But well, this guy had been in prison for eight months. And so I visited the judge, the resident judge, and one of the family and family members, the public defender. And they explained the challenges in the field. One of the things they said to me, for instance, Grand Father has eight magistrate districts. But they brought only one public defender, one country, and twenty. And then he said to me, Do you know that in each of the magistrate courts, we should have a state solicitor to have a public defender? So the magistrate, the magistrate is the judge, the, 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 the everything. It's the state solicitor, the public defender, the judge, and the magistrate. So most of these people you see in prison, the people who live in us, that's what I mean. In the face of these kind of things, how much can the advocacy for human rights be able to do? And I think I'm saying how much it goes because to what extent can you really resolve or address these uh, continuous moral violations on our entire system? I mean, uh, sometimes it's almost like you just talk and talk for nothing, but actually nothing really happens. It's, 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 it's a shame. Well, I think we all are aware of the civil society advocacy platform how it came to be. I actually started in 2017 when we met at the Mama Point Hotel when then um uh, was trying to drop from Jordan and they wanted a civil society institution that would consolidate all activities when it comes to human rights issues. Organization where human rights issues should come under one umbrella, and that's how the National Human Rights Advocacy Platform was established and we were part of the founding fathers of that institution now. Having been established, we engage the institutions, many the institutions when it comes to human rights, through the IBC Arab, the Ministry of Justice, Human Rights Division, and this is how we got ourselves involved when it comes to the NARA. What we did when we got involved with the NARA we attended meetings and we look at the NARA document looking at issues that deal with human rights. We try to really uh, scrutinize those issues to find out if indeed the government were in compliance with international best practices. And if the government did not meet up with those international best practices, what can we do in order to build, build up the best land for government to come into being? We were able to engage the civil society, I mean the government through the Ministry of, uh, through the Ministry of Justice, Human Rights Division, as plenty of many of these issues. We attended our uh, retreats, when we call it, we attended retreats for flag this now, just to give you a chance to say 20 minutes. When are we 
when it comes to the new narrative. We went into strengthening the old narrative. We found that there are so many gaps when it comes to the old narrative. The old narrative were like a working tool, but they don't have any um, monetary evaluation strategy as to find out whether the government was indeed compliant with international best practices. When you look at the old narrative, it's just moving. Now, what did we do when it comes to the new narrative? We identified those gaps and we recommended to the Ministry of Justice Human Rights Division through on advice of this. Those gaps that we left are solved and we advised that those gaps be um, injected into the new narrative. What did we do also? Realizing that the old narrative had many gaps. When it comes to the RCP era, Liberia did her first um, initial um, report to the RCP era. And part of that report that was sent up in 2016, around November, Liberia report was criminalized, and 26 days of issues were fled. And those 26 days of issues highlighted human rights components that the government must comply to or address this step to. Um, unfortunately for Liberia, Liberia would not have complied, I mean, respond to this document, to this piece of issue because we found ourselves by then in the electoral process by 2017 and the old government was uh, going by a new one of them, so Liberia would not have. However, the civil society advocates have platformed met and were able to give a perfect report on some of those thematic issues, the 26 days of issues, as to how the actuality really uh, is on the ground. And that particular document was sent and the um, advocacy platform represented like even then in July, in July of that year, March, sorry, March of that year, and presented the issue. However, when the new government got into office, those issues were actually same like and the government did all representation in July, the 9th and 10th of July. That came out of the result of the new of the NARA and that has civil society have worked. Our role in the new NARA, we look at all of these issues and flag up points. What did work? What are those um, international instruments that like you designed to? What are those international instruments that Liberia is complying to, and what are those international instruments that Liberia is yet to comply to or yet to rectify? We are able to highlight all of the issues, and it is now reflected within the new NARA. Uh, if it is complete, you will see all of those issues reflected in the new NARA. And one of those issues has to do with the 26 list of issues. We found out that in the old NARA, it did not reflect anything when it comes to the, what, the SDG, which is this, uh, 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 a sustainable development goal. But in the new NARA, the final SDG is now part of it because we fled it and looking at issues of human rights. Like we fought at the top of education, we want at the top of poverty, we fight at the top of gender equity and everything, all of those things, we fled up and it's part of the new NARA. So, um, as we said, for the minute, those are things we have done when it comes to the civil society work on the NARA. This is how we are, and we will continue to work along. But fortunately for us, I'm hearing that there is a committee step, but I do not know if civil society is on that committee when it comes to the, to the technical team to finalize the NARA. And I've been very demanding that I'm going to say, we started this work, you have to have civil society items on this particular thing in order to be flexible by the pool of component on it so that it can be worked out. So this is how we have reached in this what we have done when it comes to our work on the old era and now our work on the new era. This is what we are when it comes to our work. Thank you. I called in yesterday morning from the service, and then uh, when I just came, uh, the organizer, the, the program officer, just came to me and said, Baba, you're going to do INCH at a glance. From what background? Uh, the department 
that I represent is the department that playing with the commission, and then when the commission is implementing the plan, we monitor the plan, and then we evaluate the evaluation of the progress. So it's against that backdrop that I think the organizer told the wise that I just give INC, I see I see INC out at the glance. So I'm the director of that department, but only the guardians of a very, a very powerful commissioner. <coughs> only the leadership we can do the planning. Uh, the glances mean you, you run through the building of the ICHR, up and down, meet the, the folks in the corridor, and they are pressing, you give an impression. You're not going to go in the detail where they meet the actual research inside. Yesterday, the EDD don't uh, give the mandate of the commission, Saturday mandate of the commission. So without much ado, I begin. The INCHR was established in 2005, but because of the lack of work power, it, no work was done until 2010, in October when it was launched and began operational. The INCHR has two layers. The board commissioners, headed by a chairperson, and the secretary headed by the executive director with five directors, including the technical and support staff. So when I look at INCH at a glance, we look at the, the milestone achievement up to, up to now. And, that, and, the, and the milestone achievement that, as, again, the credit goes to the, the current board commissioners that tell the world so make operational the fast three departments with clear directors heading them. Up to today, we have recruited and deployed monitors in all the 15 counties of Liberia. Today, the ISHR is accredited as an a statute national human rights institution. And it means that with that status, we have a voice nationally, internationally, and we can fully participate in decisions regionally, nationally, internationally, bordering on human rights. That's why it's important that we together maintain our own status. But we can, we can boast today that in just a short period of time, with the current board commissioner, the secretary, we were able to achieve that status. As a massive achievement, we have done, we have reviewed the condition of prison and free trial detainees across the country and produced a thematic report. Currently, a report on the condition of health and facility is on the way. How do we proceed? And sometimes they wake up of many institutions. But the ISHR work can mostly say that we took now to go ahead in implementation of programs and progress, we have developed a five-year roadmap, the 2016 to 2021 strategic plan, providing that strategic direction in how we go ahead. We also have to talk about the mandate of the TRC that we are on obligation to implement. On that mandate, we have we constructed two memorials. One in Monserrado at the Dupo Road Massacre site, and one in Bombay at the Maher Bridge. We succeeded in building partnership with states and non-state actors, including you, the civil society. Yesterday you talked, you heard our commissioner and the director of the Department of Legislature telling you, Leslie Assistant telling you about the National Human Reaction Plan and 
They have partnership with the Ministry of Justice, the other state actors. Since we have a cause that we want to participate not internationally and nationally, regionally also, we must be in good standing. So we can say the ISH I wrote today is in good standing with membership with, uh, and has membership in regional and national bodies like the Network on African Human Rights Institutions and the NGARI, the Global Alliance on Human Rights for Human Rights Institutions. But with all the kind of achievements, the massive achievements, there are still challenges that we want you to be aware of, to go ahead. And the key one, since we are having a glance, we just go in through. The first one are while running up and down the building, the first one and going across the country. Welcome to our attention. Less knowledge by the people about the role of the ISH to protect people, protect and promoting human rights. I just live in the southeast, and you see people asking you, what kind of what you're doing? So now, now, so there's so much to be done. Not many persons across the country know our statutory <coughs> role in the protection and promotion of human rights. <coughs> when you walk through the building of the ISH era, the first thing that comes to your attention, sometimes you go in the bathroom, sometimes you see no water. And sometimes and you see no stationery, you will come to realize that the ancestral is faced with inadequate financial resources, unknown funded, to implement the mandate as a serious challenge. And because of the, the unknown funding of the ancestral to implement the mandate, there's limited outreach in route to the rural population. So in counties, in big counties like local, we only got one monitor there. So pray tell me, when can this guy go to Bahamu, to Kolamu, to Poya, to Komoreba? And some of them asked me, say, oh, but you're just running around also. They're one of the challenges you are faced with. Yesterday we saw you at uh, the Cali Junction. The other day we saw you, that day, glance at the ISH arrow. We saw you at the Calais Junction, we saw you around on hotel, and now you are on the 20th street. Yeah, we institutionally we don't have our own office. Rent payment. So when the other landlords say 100,000, we're looking at the budget, and then we run away from there. And because of that, you go back, so you go bring it there. Where can you find our monitors? No offices. You may phone call, oh, let me honor the Taisha. They may call to compile report on the Taisha and send the headquarters to see what channel you have this week. Regionally, we don't have the offices. To coordinate Bon, Neymar, Lofa, we need to have a regional office where we will bring all of the information sent by the civil society and all of the people so that they can compile and send it to headquarters. And the recommendation will be made for, for policy makers and due to barriers. But there's kind of challenges. We say this is a prospect. I think we can safely say that when you look at the national budget, some of the are the ISH is not deleted from there. So they might be, we say they are direct budgetary funding from the national budget. Do so honor funding something away. So yeah. Uh, that also include uh, minority groups. When we talk about minorities, we talk about the LGBTI or all the sexual minority groups we just mentioned. I'm just trying to respond to your question. I'm really busy. But so for so um, that aspect falls on the Department of Legislative Assistance really matters a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, a few weeks ago um, there was a proposed uh, a bill in, in the legislature to that seek to decriminalize, to criminalize same-sex practice. Same-sex practice. Uh, that bill is under review by the department, and uh, as part of our obligations to do to be uh, policy and by legal opinion, we are developing a uh, legal opinion to respond to, to that proposed uh, proposed act. Uh, but before the proposed uh, bill, we were also looking at. 
found the law that I'm in a pinnacle uh, that I seek to you know, criminalize uh, same sex practice. You know, they sort of a law, sort of a blah, blah, blah. But the point I'm trying to make is that in 2018, when the Labrador attended the, the, the meeting in Geneva, the July meeting in Geneva, the Human Rights Committee, um, the Human Rights Committee they proposed to lay a proposal. Uh, there were questions that were posed to the Labrador delegation. And some of the questions were around the rights of LGBT persons. And uh, from the response from the Labrador government delegation, it appears that the government made commitments to provide protection for minority groups, and which obviously include uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual uh, LGBT. So, I mean, in, in the nutshell, the point of it is that um, the, the commission consider that as, as, as also a uh, very important uh, practice. But they also fall within our protection mandate to the public commission. Yeah. Um, yes, I need to ask. Yeah, sorry. I'm just entering the uh, 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 some of the new challenges that you mentioned. Uh, first, I want to just uh, ask a question, and I will come back to you, uh, uh, you spent pretty close to 11,000 with the Anony, with Alliance Group. So, what benefits comes to uh, Alliance Group? What kind of benefits do you do with the Alliance Group? So I want to go back to uh, uh, Tony, because uh, I don't know, I've been, I've been really looking at what, you know, what side and what have you. Uh, I don't see much, much, much of uh, the protection of uh, this, this table group or this place. I don't see much work on that. She was most certainly on lesbian, lesbian, what have you. But uh, it's double group in your over. I don't see that much. Why? Before you come by, uh, before you come to a response, uh, my other comment would be a commissioner, uh, I would say, perhaps it would be a suggestion or a condition. Your hands are full. You are tightly uh, managing very close, don't call it for government. You are very, very is it possible? You have civil society organizations, that's what we talk about these partnership partnerships. You have all these civil society organizations in different thematic areas. For example, you have Forbes, you have FIRE, you have PF, you have GPC, but they are all very strong uh, and I'm just going to be more right? Or you make a start. Is it possible to say you kind of way uh, strategically uh, let go? Let's put it that way. Let go some of these uh, projects. For example, if you've got some funding to do monitoring or operations and so forth, is it possible to say, well, can we contact uh, platforms? You know, say, I want to be too broad, but this is a smaller group you know, and achieve more than if you are so to manage like thousand or two thousand, fifty thousand project for this one. So is it possible to do that? Thank you. I would think so. Maybe two. The first one, the last one, the one question with disabilities are needed for the EDD and the rise and talk about them. But firstly, only one as what we say to benefit or what we benefit from the the piece we pay. Very good question. In fact, I can assure you, uh, colleague. One of the reasons why the government was allowed to pay that money was because the government had to understand the benefits that is not only that we get but that the country gets. But let me just tell you something. For instance, the Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institutions. We pay 5,000 per year and we have been on that for two years right now. So that's considered 5,000 per year benefits. The Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institution uh, currently got one of our staff on internship or 
Johnny White. Johnny has done internship for one year in Geneva. We have maintained his salary, but trust me, Johnny's salary could not take care of him in Geneva. Johnny is currently on internship with the Africa branch for National Morris Institution. When we applied, only a status commission who have applied. We could not have applied, we could not have gotten Johnny if we were in debt to the Global Alliance. I can assure you that the money they pay for Johnny in Geneva is far more, far, it could be three times the 5,000 hours that we pay. So they're building the capacity of our staff. The next thing is that the Global Alliance has on two or three different occasions, there are global meetings, seminars, workshops, and training. They will pay for our staff for that. Sometimes they pay the funding for the meetings and staff. I'm sure everyone is aware of who I am, but I would just like to reintroduce myself. I'm Orita Davis, uh, one of several commissioners at the Human Rights Institution and our health oversight for the Department of Complaints, Investigation, and Monitoring. That department drives the protection mandate of the commission in terms of complaints handling, resolution of complaints, and what have you. So in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the work that we do in the protection arm of the that is the Department of Complaints Investigation and Monitoring. Um, by way of uh, establishment, the Independent National Commission on Human Rights was established in 2005 by an act of the national legislature. But that establishment has its origin in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement that was consummated among warring parties in Accra, Ghana in 2003 that occasioned the sensation of hostility in Liberia. Article 8, to be precise, of that CPA call for the establishment of a human rights commission, an independent human rights commission that will be able to serve as a watchdog between the government and civil society, which is the third sector of society. So in 2005, the commission was established and consistent with uh, Article 20, Section 6 of that 2005 Act that established the commission, it confers authority on the commission by way of the Board of Commissioners to formulate rules, procedures, and guidelines that will occasion the meeting up of our humanity. So consistent with that provision, with uh, technical and financial support from the United Nations Mission in Liberia, the Human Rights Protection Section to be precise, we were able to con contract a national consultant in the presence of Anthony Oscar Blow, and he formulated the Complaints Handling Manual. That manual was adopted by the Board of Commissioners in June 2016. And it became one of several policy instruments of the Commission that drives the protection manager. That Complaints Handling Manual, within there, it guides our work in the Complaints Department. We have adopted, by way of that manual, three tier approach towards Complaints Handling at the Commission. When complaints come to the attention of the commission, we first and foremost have to make, uh, pose some questions to us as to whether or not that complaint borders on human rights violation and whether or not the commission has jurisdiction. When we answer those questions, we just don't answer it off our heads, but we have to make sure that fundamental rights of the complainant have not been violated. If any fundamental right has been violated, then we'll make the determination as to whether or not the commission has jurisdiction. As you know, next slide, please. The complaints handling manual of the commission serves a number of objectives. First and foremost, it is used to define the procedures employed by the commission in handling and determining complaints that are brought to our attention. It is used to guide how we make that determination and how we handle complaints and arrive at our determination in that complaint. Consistent with Article 26. Next, in line, the objective of that complaints handling network is to standardize and make the process of administering complaints 
uniform through all the commission. Next in line to create a system for proper recording and documentation of complaints that comes to the commission's attention, that falls within our jurisdiction for investigation, and even those that fall outside our jurisdiction for investigation, as I go further, uh, further I will elaborate on those complaints that come to our attention that do not fall within our jurisdiction for what happens, what obtains next. Next slide. For the objective of the complaints handling manual to gain access to cases that the commission through the complaints department has handled. Another objective for information sharing with other staff of the commission. There are instances where other staff in other departments in order to deliver on the departmental objective, they will need information from the complaints department relative to complaints handling or any protection matter. Another objective is the attribution of tax to other colleagues of the commission. There will be instances where other colleagues of the commission will need information from our complaints department in order to do the work. For instance, the ED, the education department, to fulfill their radio talk show, sometimes they need information to be disseminated to the public relative to complaints handling. Who can bring complaints to the attention of the commission? How are those complaints brought? What sort of violations that complaint the commission has to restriction in all of that? Add and added background documents. For instance, we embark as part of our, our work in the complaints department, we make visitation to prisons, police holding cells, and just that's what I told someone yesterday. Anything we do in life is all about human rights. Everything, take it or leave it, but everything that we do in life is about human rights. So sometimes staff of the commission would like to get some information that the complaints department has direct access to as a result of our work. And then again, come to us and ask us that part of the objective of the complaints handling manual. Okay, and then uh, to prepare reports, graphs, and maps. As you know, the act provides that the commission prepare quarterly, biannual, and annual reports, uh, situational report, and submit seen to the heads of the three branches of government. We usually do that, but uh, there are in those reports that advance concrete recommendations for government's implementation. And if those recommendations are implemented, we'll see the improvement of the human rights situation in the, in the country. So uh, through the work that we do, our reports in the department feeds into the annual report that we circulate to the three branches of government and our partners, civil society, and what have you. Uh, in order to standardize the work that we do in the complaints department relative to the whole idea of complaints handling, management, and resolution, the uh, commission saw it fit to contract the services of Horridux. Horridux is an international NGO with based in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, that's the acronym for Human Rights Identification and Documentation System. It's a system where a status commission around the globe usually contract the services so they can come and build a comprehensive complaints handling database. And that will add public confidence and the credibility of the commission will be enhanced and will build up the public confidence in the, com in the commission's ability to handle anything relative to complaints handling. So under this consultancy, funding was identified and UNDP provided funding and then we contracted the services the, through the uh, entry of an MOU. That MOU was uh, consummated, and we saw that the first phase of this consultancy, which was divided into two phases, we saw the first phase being executed, where uh, Haridas consultants came on the ground, and in working very closely after a series of uh, engagement meetings with the Board of Commissioners, the Secretary headed by the ED, and we had a one-week working section with Haridas and the complaints handling manual, I wish to state that it is a 60-page document, it's a bit voluminous, but through the work of the, with the consultant uh, from Haridas along with the staff in the Department of Oversight, the director and the staff of the department, we, the consultancy was able to reduce the 60-page document to three-page a visual graphical image which gives you a visual presentation of the different stages in the complaints handling process. The first phase, as I told you, uh, we were able to develop a workflow which gives a visual presentation of the various stages in the complaints handling process. 
after that stage, the consultants went back, and then uh, after, thanks to Commissioner Gregory and the entire BOC headed by the acting chair, they were very instrumental in ensuring that this consultancy came into effect. Because it put us a lot on our mandate and we have to deliver on our mandate. If we don't, there won't be any excuse why we didn't deliver on our mandate. So the first phase, the work flowed and then uh, came with a report. And the second phase, after scouting additional funding from the same UNDP, where if the consultants were able to come back and they actually built the, they built the actual database, the complaints database, and they train users, and we benefited from that. Uh, what they did, they met with uh, the Board of Commissioners briefly in the sections, in part two as well, and uh, along with staff of the, the ED and staff of the Secretary, but they spent a lot of time with the Department of Complaints Investigation and Monitoring. We attended uh, the second section, and they trained us in the usage of the complaints handling database. But we see we have an unfinished business that we'll talk about later on when it comes to actualizing and operationalizing the database. You and Commissioner Gregory, I'm speaking to the modem. We'll discuss that later. But I think this is the proper forum since I'm reminded to just hint that. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, as a result of that work, uh, as I told you, the database details the procedure of receiving and recording complaints. Every complaint that comes to the Commission's attention, the database will be in a position to give you details on that. Whether it is admissible or inadmissible, but the fact that it came to the Commission's attention will be able to give you, the complaints database will give you details on that. And it gives details, but it is a very simple process of human rights investigation, mediation, hearing consistent with due process. As I told you, it has uh, uh, we adopt a three-tier approach to Wells complaint handling at the Commission. It demonstrates an effective complaints handling and management with the development of a workflow. The workflow I told you gave you a visual presentation of the various stages of the complaint handling process. Um, the database developed for registering, retrieving, updating information on all cases received by the Commission. So you see, it's a, the database will be more like useful as well for reporting purposes. And you can extract reports for annual reports and whatever we need the reports for. We can also extract statistics and graphs on the collection of cases according to relevant criteria for inclusion in the annual report and other reports. Next slide. The consultancy I told you the first phase had to do with this, and I've explained it already. It's like the 60-page uh, document was in, we're able to reduce the three-page workflow. The second phase witnessed the installation and training of users of the database. Next slide. Now this is the workflow that I told you about as a result of the work with, uh, with uh, uh, Haridas. As you see here, this entire workflow you see here, after we go through the first three pages, is the entire, it's a summary of the entire complaints handling and procedure manual. The complaint, the first stage, the complaint the reception of the complaint, the complaint is brought to the commission's attention, either by the victim themselves, by a third party, or by anyone having interest in the violation. So when it comes to the commission's attention, they are intercepted by a human rights monitor. There are other instances, real instances, where complaints come to the acting chairperson's office, and he sends his, it to us. But the first stage, the reception of the complaint, a human rights monitor will meet that person upon uh, arrival at the complaints department and listen to them to be able to make that determination on how to proceed. The next stage, registration in the database. Following registration in the database by human rights monitor, the next is to review the documentation they have brought for completeness to see if all the documents based on the complaint or human rights abuse or violations, if all the documents that are needed have been submitted. But if, in viewing the file for completeness and you realize that all of the documents are not there, you have to inform the complainant that uh, here your case for X, Y, Z documents are needed. Uh, but if those documents are correct, the next stage is for the human rights monitor investigator who's receiving the complaint to make that preliminary assessment. The preliminary assessment will tell you exactly if this complaint borders on human rights violation and if the commission has jurisdiction. 
And those two questions, if they are answered in the affirmative, then the next, we'll move on to the next stage by the preparation of the preliminary assessment report by the monitor who's receiving, who received the complaint. But there are instances where some of those uh, complaints that are brought to the commission's attention through the Department of Complaints do not border up on human rights violation, or sometimes to a very limited extent. So what do we do? Since they do not border on human rights violation, but they are the relevant government institutions responsible to handle such complaint, for instance, issue of uh, wrongful dismissal. Most people say, oh, it's labor related. Of course it's labor related, but it has human rights under two as well. But since we have the Ministry of Labor responsible to look into those matters, what do we do? We encourage the complainant to bring all of the necessary documentations. Then we make referral. We make referral to those relevant ministries and agencies. And then when we make the referrals, we don't just stop there. We follow through regularly to make sure the referrals are being attended to. We are advocate for this and we are also a lot of issues. And for every time we have issues, we check all two. That's why the commissioner presentation said when we receive a complaint, wherever it comes from, we now check whether this is admissible, whether we have jurisdiction. And then the issue, I, I should say that if you didn't receive a formal letter from us, as acknowledged that that was an error, we have to admit that. But to say that we did not pursue it is not true. We did, we did pursue it. And one way it managed before the court, I mean, and let me clarify what I'm talking about this, because some of you heard the young colleagues are talking about, like Pastor, he's playing more right for me to defend them issue. The funding issues, the, those who were seen to be evicted by law were being evicted by co orders And when the matter is before the court, this commission is start by law. So now whether you like it or not, it's law. So that said, we are an advocacy commission, but we are built on law. And all of you who are feeling with us and we have to kind of understand the implications. That yes, we can come to your defense. But to get follow up on the issue of who defends human rights defenders is the case of Afro Brunel in point. Afro Brunel was being pursued and we realized that the political agenda was being transformed to a legal post. If we have intervened uh, to let the government know that if you want to come over here for his comments, you can use the court for his advocacy. And I think that matter was uh, put to start of time. The green advocate staff, those were open, they went back to work. So it's not some of the things, sometimes we don't have a big press conference, but we have many ways of engaging. Uh, on the matter of uh, uh, chairperson resigned, and then another chairperson, four persons were invited to become chairperson. I think it will come clear for the purpose of the discussion. It behooves us to uh, glory that when we have an occasion to write law, we don't write that law with our personality in mind. The rigidity of the art that created the Human Rights Commission explicitly placed in the art that the chairperson will be counselor at law. The final judge counselor at law, senior counselor at law. Both our allies in the parliament and even the chief justice, due to his honor, have asked, so what's the criteria of the seniority? Somebody who practiced before the Supreme Court for five years, somebody has become a Supreme Court justice for 10 years, for five years, so what is this? And the five. But it's a lawyer. Now I'm talking like a lawyer, right? That those who wrote that are thought that the coming chair would be to get peace. So the potential is put in there. The way I can answer to that is that if you have to revisit some of the classes in the art, that is a food for thought. But those of us, of all of us, who will be revisiting provisions in the art to say what provision is prudent and necessary given the contemporary time of what 21st century human rights advocacy. The question of who become the chair is political. Political in the sense that when you finish your job as an independent civil society actor for the vetting process, and don't think you understand what I'm talking about, 
the recommendation goes to the president by the chief justice, his honor, of the public of the Supreme Court, right? And the chief justice attached notations and sent to the president. At that time, President Sebi. And the president had to prove it to either act or not act. That's what I've always said to my colleagues. I have a derivative power and not an executive power. I understand those concepts very well. But I mean, my style of leadership is accessibility. So normally I do that whether I have white or power. So the question of why not our partners in Nari, Gandhi, and everybody in Nari are asking that question. So when do you have the proper chair? It's political, we can answer that. Because you finish your job, right? Executive, you take up. When this new president took on, we were told, in confidence that he was approached to do two things. The first thing we did was that we put down a notice from our office that the question of chair of our pretense and protection of my office was not going to be political, it would be through the process. The process means two things will happen. If the veteran committee plays before the president dies, means the new president sitting has an option to so have a conversation with those candidates and make a determination. That's step one. Step two will be that you refer the process. You advertise, refer back to the committee, or why don't you constitute new committee and refer the process go on to a point of chair. But the anxiety and the anxiousness we saw in the new government coming to power was that to get constitute chair. And we raise the same issue now, we raise it that to do that will be absolute executive interfe interference, which will undermine the party president. So there are cardinal issues that we address, not in a lousy move, <laughs> because the uh, uh, human rights issue become also diplomatic, and we want to be careful as to not to jeopardize. But rest assured that as partners, the defense is part of our project, responsibility. We add it on the start by law. And we always ask the question of who becomes the chair. It's a political question that needs to be addressed by the CSA. On the basis of either you start the process over or you be on the need for the president. We made that reminder several times and we're still waiting for the president's intervention. These people said nothing about limited resources or funding. These people said limited resources, funding. Okay. They talk about human capacity and all the same resources, but specifically they said funding needed for engagement. So we go back to where we started. The question to you again is funding in terms of the language. Because is funding one of the major reasons why the engagement is declining, is getting weak, is failing? Is funding one of the reasons? Is my question back? Yeah. yeah, I think yes, funding. But you also mentioned you want resource. They came on the simple list. You want resource? We share limited resources. Yeah. Funding and human resource. And from my observation over the years, CSO will build her capacity, but not only the IACR, but most of the looking for greener pasture, you take people with the relevant expo exposure out of CSOs into these institutions, and you leave the institutions vulnerable. Okay, so someone else said, across the board, I hear that funding can have Funding cannot be attributed to the engagement going down. Another person said human resource. Yes. But civil society and ISHR. HR. Who has the largest human resource? Civil society, right? So I think INCHR should be looking for more human resources.
change of substance. To hold this together. To make it function. Hmm? This was just that I would have a company. I do. From the Arabic company of financial. So I don't think we should shy away from that. For example, if you call meeting, or you call meeting, there's a cost attached to that. When you want to empower some training, capacity, and things like that, funding to be attached to that. And the reason why you need to reflect that out here is that it becomes our challenge, and your challenge, which is our, to see how we can strengthen it. Because they only want to strengthen it. I've wanted to be quite a little dollar to be able to hold you for that. Yeah. Okay. Now, you see what we, well, the chairperson is setting another benchmark that will not come back to us. The chairperson has suggested, or is suggesting, that we need to flag the issue of funding, financial resources. Right? I agree. The next question would be, we are saying it is because of Partly because of funding, that's why the engagement is weak or is going down. It throws back to me. I, I assume I'm a UN now. Because this is Liberia. I assume that this proposal is coming to us out of this meeting. It said that the engagement is going down, it's sleeping because of funding. Who gets the funding? The yeah. ICSI gets the funding to engage, or civil society gets the funding to engage. Yeah, please. I don't know. You see, when we when we started the whole structuring of the platform, the INC Sharon, of course, the Human Rights Protection Service at the time initiated the discussion at Cape Hotel. And the idea was widely embraced. And during the formulation of the platform, we use the facility of the INC Sharon through us. And the acting chair, I can say openly, he participated, he supported us to have completed the entire structuring of the platform. You understand? It was for that basis that we needed a collaboration. And that collaboration needed to be defined. You understand? And I can say it clearly. We did a memorandum of understanding that both of us signed. You understand? And I made it public to the members of the platform that we have a relationship with the ICH hours. So what we needed to do was to have a strategy. We did not develop a strategy how to move forward. That is the relationship, how ISHR and civil society, the human rights community going to go out there. But if you also see elements of what is in the MOU, it talks about joint proposal development. That is the ISHR and civil society platform who have a window or eye of the abating human rights situation and we develop proposals to be able to raise funding. And on that basis, we will strengthen and be able to take on a lot of things that will help us to go forward. Again, I said, I said, maybe the strategy of engagement was not developed, so relationships started to decline. So things became more weaker. So to strengthen is the only thing that we have to really you know, build on right now to see how we can come back with that spirit. That unique spirit we started with to be able to see how we can be able to help the human rights situation within Liberia. Funding, of course, is important, but right now, the Board of Commissioners, the civil society, we have to come to a common understanding that this thing is not an individual thing, but it's a national situation, it's an institutional basis. That us move forward how we can be able to strengthen our relationship. That I can see. Okay, Adam. Thank you. You, you. you you brought me back from the question I asked again. But let me, as we're going forward, let, we also know that it is under the responsibility of the INCHR to engage civil society. Yeah. Funding, no funding, by their establishment, it is part of their mandate to engage. It's under their mandate, not only their, their, their mandate, but it's called for by the Paris principle that they should engage civil society. Yeah. The clarity I want to get is that the platform is part of the like National Society Council. Where was the Civil Society Council at the time? Because by right we are National National Human Rights Commission. Was so where? Where were they at what time? At the time the platform was having conversation with the commission. Yes. Thank you. The entire 
discussion. The discussion that resulted in the framework can be about the effect because he, Marcel, and I met initially. When they went to close the civil affairs office in Bonk County, I have gone to do facilitation for a women's group. And then I raised the issue. All male is closing all our civil affairs offices around the country where the civil society have been getting support as far as internet proposal writing and outreach on different issues. What mechanism is being put in place to ensure that civil society continues to be visible and viable as it is now? And Dr. Kaikai, Kai, who was also in our meeting, said that's a discussion I think we all need to have. So based on that, there was a discussion between Marcel, Dr. Kaikai, Kai, uh, our former secretary general, Remy Cho, and Human Rights decided that since they had money at the time, they were going to call a meeting where the discussion would start. And that's how the Cape Hotel meeting started. Uh, okay, so the lady they were there. No, no, so no. you can go far <laughs> off. <laughs> 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 they were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do I say that? And 
when I said yesterday I didn't want to prejudice in any way the discussions from the group in terms of as a commissioner trying to overshadow the talks that were coming from the University of Society. On the one hand, we have had um my intervention is basically based on a statement that Melvin made earlier. Yes, it's true that many civil societies not member of the platform. Men, uh, are coming. Many persons are not member of the platform, and many persons are not member of the council. Notwithstanding, these are people that are getting services in the counties. However, one of the things I want to hop on what he said earlier is that in the event that engagement has to take place, we must develop a criteria setting get. How is the engagement going to be and it be transparent enough that if there's supposed to be work in local county in Bogan I mean in Vaum, in Vaum, in Vaum, Kolaum, wherever part of Lupa. And maybe, maybe in the particular district you're working in, the National Civil Society Council may not have a district representative there, but there are civil society there. Those people can be utilized and brought on board with the acquis or with the knowledge of the National Civil Society group within our council, just for knowledge, so that the transparency that we all talk about can be clear. I think that's what the challenge is. We are not transparent or accountable with one another because that like, is, is a way of life. We compete, we fight, we do all kinds of things and we undermine one another. And that's why we're not going forward. And if we are human rights practitioners, we must be able to tell each other where you do wrong and be able to pick up from there and move forward. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we 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 you. Okay. So, Part one of this group, limitation of resources cannot be restricted to the This group say lack of information of communication for and CFO role. I think yesterday Commissioner Davis also put it there that, and we all agree that one issue that is stalling the relationship is lack of information. So we cannot debate around that issue. We we'll move forward. This group said, with communication, information, that flow input, it goes back to the same lack of information sharing. Then, uh, this group said, low capacity knowledge about CSO goals. And then, the gap on engagement and implementation. Of course, CSO, the ISHR needs more to enlighten CSO on their role to the commission. Because uh, perhaps CSO themselves, they can create perception. They, they, they see the INCHR as a different body and they don't know what role they have to play with the INCHR. So maybe you come back to information sharing again that the INCHR need to better inform CSO of their role. I see the INCHR have a radio program already running and maybe as part of your agenda on this radio program is to call up CSO and tell them what you expect of them. You know, perhaps that would be education. Then we go to perception. I get a perception. A lack of information will cause perception. Lack of collaboration, CSO participation, collaboration, draft. I don't know. But as part of the expectation of the National Human Rights Institution, if you go there, they say that CSO should participate in the drafting of all planning document of the commission. Yeah, it was there, right? So if the CFO are not your part of designing your different strategies, it is always good they, you, you get them involved. It's part of the requirement of National Human Rights Institution. So that is it. Then we go to what? Lack of expectation on both sides in terms of deliverables and provision systems. Well, again, we'll come back to the point, I don't understand the more, but maybe CSO expects something from INCHR in terms of, you know. Yeah, group two, provision systems. And maybe CSO expecting some assistance from 
from ISHI. Is that what you mean? Yes, sir. I see this expectation now is dark. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit of a focus. This group is thinking, this group is supposed to do this, this group is thinking, this is supposed to do this. So it's not about, you know, uh, in terms of going forward. Because I want to throw back that Commissioner Gray, Commissioner Gray will be because of the discussion besides the platform we needed the works in this gallery. Because the ECC, the Council of Churches, the National Teacher Association, the civil That they are not him already. How can we in this meeting get all of them in this discussion? Because the mixture of the people we should have had here, and I believe the representation is in this. So it goes back to your signing of your MOU. Signing MOU with these people, the party does not end your engagement. Because an upper. They are. Strategic paper framework of CSO and ICHR engagement. Is there a 2017 strategic framework? ICHR and CSO? Hello? Is there a, a strategic frame, a paper framework with CSO? ICHR. The question here is they said you should review the 2017 strategic paper framework. Is there one? They are saying that the way forward is that we should review 2017 strategic paper framework or, or CSO and ICHR engagement. There is one. There is one. Okay, they say that one way forward. Secondly, they are saying, let's see, let's have one house. Inclusively work with CSO organization. They are saying inclusively work with CSO organizations. We we accept that. Yeah. Eh? To work for CSO actors, non-money organizations. Yeah. It's part of the requirement to work with them. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. I don't understand why you say inclusively work with them. Commissioner, I'm telling you, you understand what is my inclusive work with them? They are saying one of the solutions is inclusively work with CSO organizations and appointment actors. I don't know. I'll I, I roll it.
Now, I know much about what's like the issues that I mean, the ISCR will be working on. And maybe the institution may not be knowledgeable about it, but they should engage the expertise of these CS groups. So that's a problem for the institutions. But it was not individuals that did not capture. So not necessarily an organization, but actors. An organization strong individuals or actors. Uh, if it's clear to you, okay, it's clear to you. Go regular meetings. No, you're, you're discussing the strategy. But for me, inclusively, after you meet, bring all of them on a one and work with them. Let me get a reason. I'm going to have a particular issue. I raised the issue about the work that we did for the women on the sit down. Okay. I went for several trainings on the commission for the status of women. I mean, the commission on the status of women, I look at the sit down and its implementation in Nigeria. So, expertly, I know that the sit down is implementation. Maybe my organization, everybody there, don't have the expertise, but I look at it. So, you engage me because of my experience and my knowledge of the so okay. that's what I was saying in terms of that. Okay. Hold regular meetings. That solution is a whole regular meetings. Need for more cohesion. I don't know what it was. Need for more cohesion. Need for more cohesion. Proactive collaboration in the implementation of projects. Strengthen and project and strengthen engagement gap between CSO. They want more engagement in project writing. Yes, we want to be involved in it. But let's say, let me just take this, it was not just yes or yes, you want to make sure so that two persons talk. So if both IMCs are SS or the other side of the world, Yes, but you know what I'm saying? The IMCs are and CS should work on the issue of projects. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So let's see us make more than CS or CS or what? Oh, okay, the ISC and CSO say it. Okay, so it didn't CSO want to work with. Okay, all right. Okay. This one says effective and efficient engagement communication. This one comes with communication. They are saying that both parties should communicate with each other more effective and efficiently. Mapping CSO specifically involved with human rights activities. Who, who's doing that? They say there should be a mapping of CSOs directly involved with human rights activities. Both parties. Okay, but let me let me ask you a question. Rural women, rural women, they are involved in agriculture and farm produce. Are they involved with human rights? Yeah. Every activity So which group now you are in school? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But they are dramatic priority. What do you work with at what time? Undertaking CFO capacity assessment to support areas of collaboration. Of course, this is one of, one of uh, the commission future projects to, to, to capture this. So I think they should take it serious. CFO is proposing this. And, uh, it's a both parties are but both parties, uh, you, you stated area undertaking CFO capacity. So is the IC that you should, you should undertake their capacity? CSO says that the capacity should be done by smart. I can switch out. Is it that clear? It's clear. Yeah. It's clear. Yeah. Okay. Captain, but at least we have a framework. And we will certainly not be able to do all the things. Or I think there's becoming a general consensus in the room that there be another session to finalize it, put it into a uh, Framework, a strategic framework that we can then sign on and oh, give a rollout. Maybe I won't be the list of this. Please be prepared to fund uh, the OHHR funds the next convening for us to finalize this. I want to beg you to sit a little bit. Uh, and let me respond to your suggestion. We will do it on this document based on a small technical team to finalize this. We we'll discuss that one. At least there is an agreement to do something. Yeah. But we can have a bigger group like this, but instead of two days, we'll do it one day. So it's, it's. But let me just say quickly that uh, some of you who know me very well will notice that I'm not too uh, uh, regular, rush and push kind of person the past few days. Ago. I'm talking about a really. Uh, I mean, I've eaten something in Canada that did not get me food poisoning. Uh, yeah, I've been really struggling the past two days from my stomach and setting, but I'm just acting strong. Having said that, this is just quickly, so let me just relax myself a little bit. Uh, so, as I said, we had an engagement with civil society uh, in February 2000, sorry, 2017. So it's almost two years, uh, and I think that was on the 17th, so 16 and 17, so it's two years ago. And the objective for that meeting, as you see, was to strengthen the relationship between, I mean, amongst ICR and civil society for the promotion and protection of human rights. And we also need to put in place mechanisms for early referrals of complaints to relevant institutions and a system for tracking and monitoring. In 2016 or August, July, August, end of July, beginning of August, the Commission undertook a study tour with Geneva. And in addition to a lot of people on the Commission who have background from civil society, and other people on the Commission who, like for instance, Commissioner Tho, who had an institutional memory. And some of us who, in different capacities, work together with civil society. I work closely with civil society as when I was with the head of the peace building office. We knew how important it was to work with civil society. But during the discussions in Geneva, uh, civil society was one of the, the our relationship, the root national human rights relationship with civil society institutions was discussed. We have uh, one civil society institution that's based in Geneva, but it's a bigger consortium, it's a representative of a consortium of civil society institutions, had uh, a two-hour session with the representation from the commission. So we came very aware of a lot that we needed to do to collaborate with civil society. I just wanted to spread this point so that some of our civil society colleagues do 
nothing is being deliberate that we're not engaged. So we also decided to establish proper coordination to enhance, enhance collaboration with civil society and other institutions that will reduce duplication of efforts and to set in place a broader platform for advocacy, you know, for the promotion and protection of human rights, including monitoring and reporting. We also wanted to ensure that we have strengthened the capacity of CSO and related institutions through human rights education and training, and to the extent possible, IC shall for obtain data and information on human rights violations through CSO networks deployed in the counties. Tamar Johnson will say when they brought information to us, we didn't act on it. We also, then we have a few expected outcomes that we said the engagement should lead into, that there will be the network and collaboration between INCHR and civil society organizations forged and strengthened. And then, of course, we talk about the coordination mechanism that will have been in place, as I mentioned, for monitoring, evaluation, reporting. Ultimately, it will, have, it will then lead to the violations uh, of citizens' human rights across the country being reduced. Then we agree on what would be some joint activities that we we'll do together. And some of the joint activities we thought would be to monitor the implementation of national human rights commitments, uh, to prepare par parallel reports and submit on human rights treaties uh, bodies to human rights treaty bodies to engage in the universal periodic review of implementation of the recommendations. In fact, there is a there is a specific document. I don't know if you guys have a civil society, but I can share with you. I know you are to be very much aware of this. It's called CIVICUS. It's C I C I V U S. Uh, it's just a one sheet. It's not a big, big document, but that CIVICUS is mainly on the role of civil society institutions in working with governments to achieve universal peer review recommendations. It's, it's purely on civil society. So it's a lot that you got to do that. Then we, we thought that we would have activities to raise awareness on human rights concerns at, at the national level, conduct research on fair human rights thematic issues and areas, and then we could coordinate and collaborate to ensure government upholds various human rights frameworks and global, global strategies, for instance, the SDGs. There is a United Nations framework, very interesting United Nations framework called the United Nations Declaration on the Right to Development. But there's, there's also a United Nations framework on youth and human rights. There is a United Nations framework on the age, the aging, aging population, the old people. So there are a couple of frameworks that we get at least all of them that we think there are many ways to collaborate. Uh, then uh, we thought that we could understand, promote, and provide inputs to the government on upholding regional and international human rights standards, engage the media, to promote human rights education and sensitization. And of course, uh, we said we could jointly raise funds to implement human rights advocacy activities and expand human rights, and, and expand human rights programs. We discussed a little bit of who should be the targeted institutions. Now, I'm not sure the National Civil Society platform, advocacy platform was established by this time. Adam, I here? It was, it was. It was established. It was. But I think the discussion we had was that we will uh, work, we recognize the broader National Civil Society Council of Liberia. And if we were to have established a relationship or an MOU or an ABMOA on our engagement, that ABMOA would, uh, would uh, spell out how we would collaborate with the thematic uh, institutions under the platform. So there's a broader overarching MOU, but then there is some specificities when it comes to the different thematic or institutions beneath the platform. So, but we also were clear that given we didn't have everybody part of the platform or part of the council, and there were still other civil society institutions doing a lot of other work, we say we we'll also target NGOs and CSOs. Uh, with human rights related activities. Of course, this will even mean our human rights defenders as may be in some of the counties. 
we then finalize on what would be the, the methodology or the strategy to roll out the activities and to achieve what we wanted to achieve. And then we said we need to 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 to, to force the partnership to engage at two levels. At the strategic level and at the working level. At the strategic level we said that we involve civil society and related institutions in the human rights strategic planning processes and in the development of other human rights related policy frameworks. Then we said that we include coordinating to provide policy advice to the government to enhance, uh, I mean, to ensure human rights based approach to the formulation of programs. For instance, this is not detailed, but just assume right now the government is developing a national budget. We shortly be developing a national budget. There is a human rights based approach to budgeting. In fact, uh, I have an interesting book, uh, thanks to Commissioner Thor, who just brought it from New York. And uh, it, it says uh, human rights budgeting, no, or uh, uh, government, human rights, human rights based approach to government budgeting. It's, it's purely, now how could us, these are some of the things, rather sometimes when than, than being, Assume we are not seeing this document. We came here today with a fixed mind that we need to engage, we need to strengthen our collaboration, and this is how we should do it. What you brought in this program in your mind for collaboration, we want it to come from that group. Information. Thank you, Commissioner Gray. Um, and then we're going to also uh, do justice to this room. We uh, just said that the, I thought the, the summary that Commissioner Gray had earlier developed will actually reflect on the first memorandum we had because it's very important. Mm -hmm. I've seen a modification of most of what he's done because when we formed the platform. We, we, we broke the platform down into thematic areas that capture vulnerable groups, women and children groups, on our fields, even down to transitional justice. You understand? We leave the low element within the human rights body out. So we had the, the platform structured like that so that the commission could not have a lens like she's looking for human rights to be all in the community, but she would have a body that will be the half of all the counties and working with all the smaller human rights groupings. But now that I see modification to what the commission is going to be drafting into, they kind of like put me to this point to inform this body. So my colleague and other people who be here will have a picture of the agreement we entered June 15, 2017. I remember the date I have talked about it, where she had the acting chair and myself to sign. And then we got it, and then very, very happy was in our meeting with the was in our medical program with Sam, where the Francis was signed at the level. We have the copy here. It is good for it to be blue, blue up there, so everyone can see your picture. And then moving forward, we will have to move the modification. So I want to just make this clear to us so that we'll do justice to the level of the world. Okay. So you are saying that, that, that you signed another document with the commission that is different from this? Let me just, let me respond back quickly, so, very short. So, I'm, what I reflected is not a revision of what we signed with you. Like you read for the book, what we signed, you didn't mention the date, it was June 2017. This is February 2017. So, it can be backward, there is a revision of what we signed with you. Now, this again was not a document signed. It was a product all of an engagement like this, where we decided on a framework, which unfortunately was not uh, finalized and operationalized. But then subsequently, when we had that proposal to go forward, we had that particular document, which we also have on our board. But that's what reflected this is February 2017, and not in June. So what you say, but it's good, it's good yeah. This is parallel to the same 17, like you said. 
And the one that you are going on is June 2017. So this is so over. Yes. The draft of data was done in January 2017. The signing process due to they call it correcting two dots, they carry us to June. You understand? So if you say you have modified something in February, you understand it, then they just leave me in people with a mentality. But be as a day, I think we want to move forward in the best way how to have a strong collaborative relationship. And I just wanted to remind you that when you broke it down, with all the thematic movements that you mentioned by the LGBT group, they are also